Bishop Ron Ash. Amen. Let's say amen as he comes. So Jesus was invited over to somebody's house for dinner one day. Actually, he was invited to religious leaders. So he sat among all the preachers. You may be seated. And while he was sitting there to eat dinner, the religious leaders, as was their tradition, washed their hands. And Jesus did not wash his hands. And everybody was in amazement that this great spiritual leader who knew how to do everything right, decided to associate with those who didn't know how to do things right. They were somewhat as astonished and some were even offended. How dare you come into our house and you know our tradition and you won't wash your hands. And Jesus told them, you sons of the devil, he wasn't talking to the drug dealer or to the politician. He wasn't talking to the crack addict or the person who lies to make a million dollars. And he was talking to the religious leaders of his day and said, how dare you make me uncomfortable and I'm the invited guest. He said, that's the problem with this generation. It is wicked. It only wants to appear like it's clean. He says, you're the kind of people that give 10% of every dollar you make. But you never, ever have a heart to touch people you meet. It's easier for you to pay tithes than to actually go out there and feed the hungry. You have failed at what my father called you to do because you were so busy trying to sit in these special seats that you forgot that this seat is only important because it helps these seats. And so you fix yourself up. Every day you get all dressed up. You put so much emphasis on how you look this morning. Matthew 23, when you get a chance, read it at home. That's your homework. He said you get so busy dressing up so that people know you're different on the outside. But you haven't changed your inside. You look right. You say the right things and you do the right things, but you have touched no one. And again, he calls them, you sons of the devil. Not the world, as we call it, but the church. We have become sons of the devil because our value is seen in getting here. Recently, I've been dealing with my own infirmity, my own sickness. I have been dealing with trying to overcome it and dealing with all my doctor's appointments and thereby I had to cancel several meetings and several conferences I was supposed to speak at and couldn't make some of the things I was supposed to go at. And so I'm not, you know, as it is, and I'm habitually late everywhere, so people don't necessarily invite me as much. And I'm not really concerned about that, but I was talking to somebody and somebody said, Bishop, um, aren't you a little concerned? You don't have that many ministry engagements. And I looked at him, I said, I don't understand what you mean. They said, but do you have, are you preaching anywhere next month? I said, no. Are you preaching anywhere the month after? I said, no. They said, well, what are you going to do about your ministry? I said, huh? I don't, I don't understand the question. They said, your, it seems like your ministry is, is not being used. I said, excuse me, preaching? That's not ministry. Every moment of my life, there are opportunities. There's a man in the Renaissance era called Francis. Francis became 
a priest in the Roman church and hated the abuse and what he had seen and started a movement called the Franciscans. And when he was about to die, they said, so what will we base this order upon? What do we base our lives on? He says, preach always. And if you must, use words. Preaching has little to do with our vernacular and our vocabulary and our eloquence. Anybody can be a shyster. Anybody can give you the right words. How many women bank their whole life and paycheck on men who were smooth and said the right thing and had a girlfriend round the corner? This, words should never move us. It is the action. It is what we do with the life that we have. It sickens God to hear people lust for the pulpit and every moment of their life they walk by people dying and are hungry and going to hell. Jesus says to this generation, 2,000 years in the future, we are still guilty of the same religious mindset that he saw then. What was that mindset? He sat among them and said, you wash your hands, but your heart is dirty. You say the right things to the right people, but the people that need to hear you, you don't have the time to stop and listen to their word and their story. He goes on in the same 23rd chapter and says this to them. Well, actually, one of the guys that's sitting there is like a preacher. He is the teacher of the law. And the teacher of the law says, hey, chill. People are hearing what you're saying and they may misunderstand God forbid you disrespect us in public and then the people won't respect us and Jesus said no it's not the things that I say that's going to make them not respect you they don't respect you because you don't care about them see when you ask family to come to church and they say nah that's okay there's a reason there's a reason your neighbor has never asked what church you go to there are reasons why our churches are empty and our cars are empty when we drive to church. We're asking God for bigger cars and the car we got now, we drive every Sunday empty. Evangelism? The world has a carpool lane. Evangelism? If your commitment for the rest of your life was to do nothing else but make sure that every seat in your car was filled every Sunday. Just to pick up the people who don't have a car. That testimony alone. Yeah, but gas is expensive. Oh, Jesus already told you if you come and you follow me, it's going to cost you. How much is it going to cost me? It's going to. The cross is everything. There's nothing left at the cross. When you are dealing with the issue of death, you ain't counting dollars. When you're dealing with the issue of death, you ain't trying to be cute. When you deal with the issue of death, it's not about your personality. There's nobody trying to save face when they're dying. One of the old, old movies about a gangster. Old, old. It's before Al Pacino. I know some of y'all think that's as far as it goes. but Way back before New Jack City. We're talking about real gangsters. <laughs> One of the guys was about to die and faced the electric chair. And, and as he was about to die, and his whole life he had saved face. His whole life he had, been he had been the strongest guy. And they knew he wasn't gonna go out like no punk. He wasn't gonna die like no sissy, not him. And when he saw that chair in front of him and they were taking him away, he began to holler and scream and fight. See, death, death frees me from my ego. It is the reason we are supposed to live every day like we are dead. Listen to the words of Jesus. He says, you Pharisees and Sadducees, you know what you've become? White washed tombs. You know what a white washed tomb is? He says, this is what your, your religious institutions have become. Graveyards filled with dead people that look good as they place them. Do you know how much money we spend on funerals to make a person who's already dead ain't even there look good? 
Funerals are a sin. I'm sorry if you're a funeral director. Bless you. We need your tithe, but we don't need your services. I'm sorry. Not... You're going to pay $8,000 for me to look pretty now, and I've been hungry for the last two weeks, and you ain't gave me $5 to get a sandwich? You're going to pay $5,000 for a box to put me in the ground. And if you had given me that $5,000 so I could have got a down payment on a little place somewhere. Jesus says, you are whitewashed tombs. You are good for nothing. You serve no purpose. Your value is zilch, zero. He, Jesus goes on to say so much in the book of Corinthians. He says, I don't even want your money. In the book of Corinthians, New Testament, he says, please don't give. Don't tell Pastor Kelly I preach this all on. <laughs> don't give a dime if you give it grungingly. I don't want it. If you give it to be seen, keep it. If you want a prophecy and you're giving it, you keep it. I can't do anything with it. If you get any recognition for what you do here, I can't do for you anything there. What you do here must come from here because if it comes from here, I can't use it. Watch. He says, keep it. Jesus tells the same people, if you give money, if you give it. But you don't want to become involved in the lives of the people who you sacrifice for, then, then why do I want it? In Psalms 20, God says to the Jews, because the Jews said, well, I'm giving, Lord. I'm giving because I, I know you need, you need me to give. You, you need me to help you build your kingdom. God says, excuse me. If I was hungry, God says, I wouldn't tell you. Hear that. God says in Psalms 20, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The cattle on a thousand heals the mind. You hear what he's saying here? We love to quote that verse, but, but that verse is actually an injunction against us. He's saying, I don't need what you have. What's in your pocket? I don't need it. My needs are always met. But I need you to feel the weight of other people's burdens. Somebody asked me recently when I was flying somewhere and they said, they said, uh, they're Buddhist and they were trying to, uh, we were just discussing religion and theology and all, all different things. They said, the, my, my problem ultimately with, with the idea of God as, as it is espoused is this. My problem with the idea of God is how can a good God let bad things happen to good people? How? about the question of Darfur? How about the question of the Sudan? How about the question of Ethiopia and the hungry? How about the question of Haiti, who after an earthquake, they killed, we still don't know the numbers, close to maybe a quarter million people, some of the real numbers. There are always the false numbers. Of course, a quarter million people maybe that, that, that now cholera has broken out in the camps. And the people that survived the earthquake are dying from diarrhea, being so dehydrated that mothers are holding three-year-old babies in their hand and can see every rib and cannot stop them as the bile pours out of their baby, holding on to them and saying, God, what did we do to you to deserve this? And every Sunday, we, did you know about Jesus? Ooh, he's all right. There are real questions, questions that we don't want to ask and don't have the answer for, questions that we write checks every Sunday to avoid. Let me put a few dollars here so you can help them because I don't have the nerve to help them because it may cost me more than a tithe. Right? Easy to write a check, hard to get involved. That is a secret to benevolence. Any 501c3, any nonprofit knows that if you want to get big money, you show people how terrible things are so that they can ease their conscience by writing big checks because they don't have the wherewithal to get involved. Easy to write a check, hard to get on a flight and spend weeks there. When I was in Sierra Leone years ago, right at the height of the Muslim rising up in that country and 
If anybody was there from outside of the country at the time, they had to sneak them out. I'll never forget being in the cab, hiding under a bushel of clothes as they were trying to get us to the closest airport because America was offering an airlift out. As we had passed by, there was a body, a, a, a mound. I thought it was clothes. They were burning clothes and tires. And as we had passed by the stench of this seven-foot-tall mound of burning clothes and tires, as we got to stink, and I thought, oh, the tires are terrible. And I said, but that doesn't smell like tires, as I looked barely out the, peeked out of the window, I realized that those were not tires and those were not clothes. That was the body of 200 people. Some were still moving, burning to death, as Muslim insurgents on the side had sticks and would push them back in. When we got to the airport, and jumped on a plane and was taken from there and we flew down to South Africa where we would catch a flight to come back, get back to the United States. Everything inside of me said, I have just failed. I have run away like a punk from what God has called me to be at. How dare I save my life? And we overcome Satan. By the words of our testimony, watch, and the blood of the Lamb. How do you overcome it? By the words of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. What is the word of my testimony? And they loved not their life, even unto death. What makes great people is the ability to cease loving their life. We have become a generation that heaps, heaps comfort. We don't drive cars without air conditioners. We live in homes that have air conditioners. We f cover our beds with 1,200 threaded sheets. Some say, huh? I don't even know sheets had that many threads. <laughs> if you ain't never slept on one. We love not our lives, even unto death. They love not their lives, even unto death. What gives us power over the devil? What gives us power over the devil? It is to kill me. I ain't scared of death. You never want to fight a man whose first words are, well, you better kill me. <laughs> you better not leave me here half dead. I will hunt you, your mama, your daddy, your uncle, your first cousin. I will find you. That's the kind of person that I was only playing. I'm like, Get out of here. You're so serious. You better find someone. You don't fight someone that has nothing to lose. The reality of the gospel is I have nothing. We have nothing to lose. The pursuit of ministry, it astounds me. I, was, I have a friend of mine, Bishop Tudor Bismarck. If you've never heard Bishop Bismarck, he's a very close friend of mine. And we talked hours this week, hours on the phone. And he kept calling me, he says, I don't know why I asked. He said, but I've been listening to you recently. And he says, I need you to come to Africa. He says, we need you to come here. And I said, I, I said, Whatever the Lord wants, but he says, he says, but, but, but you got it. He says, God is speaking to me. He says, my mistake was recently that I, I had almost become like the Americans. I let some of the things that they were saying kind of mess with me a little bit. He says, but I listened to one of your messages and it reminded me of what I was called to do. He said, he said, I remember when Jake's first invited me to preach at Potter's house and they got me the presidential suite. He says, and when I got in the bed, he said, I could put half my church in it, <laughs> which isn't true. He's got a church of 20,000 people, you know. He says, it's a small church for Africa. And he was sleeping, and he said, he, I couldn't sleep. He said, I was turning, and he said, and I looked where the bathroom was. I wanted to get something to drink, and I said, that's kind of far. <laughs> he says, and, and I could feel while I was asleep in that bed my anointing leaving he says, and I got out of the bed quickly, and I got one sheet and a pillow, and I slept on the floor for the three nights that Jake's paid for me to sleep in a presidential suite. He said, I didn't do it for false humility. He said, I slept on that floor because there were people in my church, thousands that slept on the floors of huts. And how could I be their pastor and luxuriate five minutes of enjoyment, even though the scripture says, I deserve it as a man of God. I had to keep me humble. 
I have to remind me the price it is. Watch what Jesus says. It is the loving of one's life that gives you demonic access. You have demons messing with you? Stop loving your life. You have spirits in your house? You don't need to open your Bible to Psalms 91 and put it on your coffee table. What you need to do is stop loving your life. There are demons that perplex your mind and your life. It is the loving of your life that gives demons legal access. You can't kick a devil out that you invited in. You can't be mad at cats that keep gathering around your back door when you put milk out for them every week. You live a life consumed with the things of the world and wonder why the prince of the world keeps messing with you. Jesus said there are some demons that only come out through prayer. And fasting. Why fasting? Why does fasting give us so much power and authority? Because fasting is the purposeful neglecting of one's most important need. If I can tell my body that needs food, you ain't getting it. Then I can tell my lust that says you need her, you ain't getting it. You need that. You ain't getting it. If I can conquer the need to live, I can conquer any demon. But most of us can't turn down a Snickers bar, let alone a meal. <laughs> Jesus knows what's in your heart. He knows that some of you every day say, if you ask people, why, why don't you go to church? They'll tell you, there's some people sitting here who... Who go? I, I, when I was coming up, and I'll get there in a second. When I, I remember going to church because you were told to go to church. You go to church because your family went to church. It's, you went to church because you bought the pew in the church. You go to church because family reunion and everybody goes to church. You go to church because, well, it makes you feel a little better when you go to church. You go to church because maybe that's where you'll meet somebody to marry. You go to church for all kinds of reasons except the right reasons. We, we go to fulfill the minimal moral obligation of a deprived soul that is like a vacuum cleaner that needs to fill itself with something because it is constantly empty. St. Thomas Aquinas says of the soul that God has made the soul empty, yet it can contain everything. It is the biggest thing in the world, your soul. He says it is greater in, 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 in proximity and in, 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 in depth than anything the human being will ever, ever fully understand. He is filled with a vast expanse of nothing and will spend a lifetime trying to fill it and nothing will fill it save that that is big enough to contain everything. Only God can fill that vacuum. Y'all need to put a clock up here. I can't see what time it is. Only God can fill that. Have you ever worked your whole life to buy something you really wanted? Only to get it? And not a month after getting it, you see something else you want just like it? I never forget when I moved to Miami, I wanted the five uh, Mercedes SL500 AMG package. Zero to 60 in 4.8 seconds. $128,000 off the floor. By the time I had bought it and was driving down Miami Beach, while I was somebody, I had put the top down, the hard top that goes up, boom, 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 like, like a transformer. <laughs> oh, come on, baby. I was sitting in it, you know, dropped the seat way low, cocked it to the side. Put my sunglasses on. I thought I was somebody. I pulled up at a red light. I said, had me a little Jill Scott in the background. <laughs> Old school Jill Scott. Let's take a long walk. <laughs> and I heard right next to me pull up. You got to tell Tyrone. And a Bentley. Boom. Boom. I said, ain't that the devil? 
that's a beautiful car. How much is that car? I pulled off, humbled, and didn't like, I said, this is some raggedy Mercedes. Because the... cars will never, there will always be another car prettier and better than yours. There will always be someone else or something else. There will always, I never, there will always be something that looks different. If you buy something, the day you drive it off the lot, it already decreases in value. The only thing of value that we should really, the only thing that can fill us is Him. And all of the things we grab and grasp and try to buy, our life is filled trying to fill this. It is filled with, I thought that the height of my ministry was to preach for Jake's. I left Jake's pulpit empty. I left Eddie's pulpit empty. I left all those people's pulpit empty. Didn't know it because I was sitting among people that were empty. They were successful at preaching. They were successful at things. But I held the conversations with them in the back. And it just ends, tends to be filled if you continue to live the life that you think people want or what they expect from you you will destroy your own spiritual longing for him preach always and if you must use words Abraham Abraham Heschel Abraham Heschel one of the greatest Jewish philosophers I have mentioned him many times in preaching here Heschel who is a man that I admire greatly Abram says these words he stood next to Martin Luther King in, Ab in Birmingham Alabama when they marched for civil rights and he stood right next as a Jewish man whose father was a survivor of the Holocaust and marched with Martin Luther King. And when he got back to New York, a newspaper reporter wrote, asked him a question, what were you thinking standing next to Dr. King? What went through your mind? He says, I was not thinking. My feet were praying. Abraham Heschel was asked by another person, did you have any speaking engagements? when you were in Alabama, Birmingham, did any of the synagogues invite you to come speak? He said, no, Dr. King invited me to speak. They said, but you said nothing by him. He says, you did not hear my feet speak? My feet spoke to generations that were not yet born. And my feet spoke to great, great grandparents that died by the abuse of others. My feet spoke louder than my words ever could because I decided to take the risk to stand next to someone for what was right in the face of what's wrong. Keep your money if your life isn't attached to it. Keep your chair if your life isn't attached to it. I know Pastor Woods, I know this church. I was here when it started. I was here before it was started. I prophesied to Kelly, and only I can, don't you call him Kelly, I call him Kelly. But Kelly was the youth pastor at another church here. He didn't invite me because I was popular. I wasn't popular then, I'm not popular now. He invited me because he heard something in my voice that was different than other people preaching. I was a young kid, 20, 21 years old maybe. Talked to somebody last night who said, I was just with Dr. Iona Locke in South Carolina. And she said, please give me Ash's number. They said, you know Ash? She said, do I know Ash? I know Ash when he wore cowboy boots to church. <laughs> I know Ash when he had an asymmetrical haircut. I said, that's the devil, I never. <laughs> Why people don't have asymmetrical haircuts? Huh? She said, I was preaching for Bishop McMurray. He was in the back. I saw him praising. I didn't know what it was. She said, I threw him the mic. He was 17 years old. He wrecked the church and then had the nerve to give me the mic back. I've been his friend ever since. Because then and now I still hear something that reminds me why I was called to preach. She says she almost gave up ministry. I didn't know this, and I own is a great friend of mine. She says, I was four or five years ago, she says, right when uh, Bishop Wagner, right around the time he had passed away, she said he was my mentor, and I was 
going through a lot and he was getting, he was getting sick. And she said, I wondered why I did all of this. She says, I started a church that has never grown more than 300 people. I'm struggling with when I preached in congregations that had five, 10,000. What's wrong? What's going on? And she said, I forgot why I was doing what I did. And she says, and then I listened to Ash or I talked to him. She said, and, he, and it reminds me, it reminds me why we do this. It, we don't do it for, for first class tickets and briefcases. We don't do it for collars and robes. We don't do it for the money and the offerings. We do it because we are the first partakers of God's grace. You tell Ash she's got a friend in Detroit. That's what she said last night to a friend of mine. Do you understand why we do this? We do this because Jesus says you give, you give and you give and you give and you give and you give, but you, you don't feel. Imagine you bring home flowers. And you, your husband brings home flowers and he gives you those flowers and he says, here, and you're like, oh, oh my God, you thought about me. And he says, nah, I was at a funeral and they had a bunch and somebody just. <laughs> he brings home flowers and, and, and he says, he says, yeah, I was at the grocery store, they were on sale. He brings home flowers and. You are excited, and his words are, oh, you, I really wasn't thinking about you. I just got him actually for the table. Every Sunday, we are like that husband. Every Sunday. Because the wife is saying, I don't need the flowers. I need the heart. You can do all the right things, but if your heart is not in it, it cheapens the value of the gift. The gift is only symbolic gesture to reveal the mystery of the heart that beats but I can't see it or I can feel it when I rest my head in the middle of the night every now and then I know you don't like to be touched at night but I throw my arm over your chest because I want to feel your heart because I'm in love with what I can't see but and God says every day about us I love you and I need you to love me but you cheapen the gift because you say, I give because you need it. I don't need it. I give because you're trying to buy a building. What? You increase your giving because New Covenant needs a bigger building? Shame on you. Shame on Keep your dollar. You increase your giving because he has loved you so much and when you leave this building and look at folks that are living their life don't go to church at all and look at the young woman who is immense who's so skinny no she been out all night awake smoking crack and drugs and look at the young couple that are slipping out of a hotel room and can't and then one of them got a husband someplace else or a wife someplace else you know god thank you that could have been me I'm finished, I'm through with my first point. No, I'm not. <laughs> Jesus says to that generation and to this generation, he says to those men who are washing hands, washing hands, washing hands. You spend, we spend a lifetime looking right. How long did it take you to get dressed today? How long did it take you to figure it out? Huh? What did you think about? When you got dressed today, what religious ritual did you go through so you don't offend anybody? One of the guys said at the table, Jesus, you offend us. Jesus says, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Offend you. If you can be offended, you're not in my kingdom. What? Nothing more. I, I'm so glad I don't pastor anymore. I told God it recently. I told God, I said, thank you. Thank you for killing, almost killing me. To get away from people. Do you know the stuff that my pastor, here I am preaching the kingdom. You know what 90% of my meetings were about? Ushers who had attitudes because someone didn't respect me. So-called preachers who got offended because I let someone else speak instead of them. People who wanted pulpit positions but I couldn't count five people they were directly responsible for that they had brought to church you mad because you ain't got a seat 
and there's 40 empty seats in the back? You mad because I won't let you sit here? You got to sit out there? You ain't worthy to sit out and sit here and you ain't brought nobody to sit out there. The only reason you ought to be able to sit up here is because there's no room back there. So when you fill that space, then bring your behind up here. I don't care if you're an usher or a 10-year-old kid. If you can fill those seats, you can have that seat. <laughs> Truth is, some of you deserve these seats more than some of us. I talked to Pastor Kelly last night. He's traveling all over the country in the next several weeks, next several months. And he's going all over the country to look at churches that are passionate about God. Passionate. And so I said, Kelly, I'm in a strange place in my life. I don't want to be connected to anybody. I don't care. what. It, I'll be broke. I will serve. You know what I did last week? I went through the Yellow Pages and found all of the places that have volunteer opportunities in the Berkeley area so that I could start to become actively involved. Last week, I went to the park, and when it got cold, I bought, I didn't have a lot of money, but I went to Walmart, and I bought about 15, 20 of the cheap blankets and just went to the park and passed them out because a year and a half ago, I slept in a park in Sacramento for three nights because I was homeless a year and a half ago. Because my friends that were driving Bentleys and Rolls Royces, who I called and said, I'm homeless, never called me back. My friends who are passing churches with 20,000 people only help you when you're up, not when you're down. You find out who your true friends are when all hell breaks loose. I it was only the Woods family that helped me when I had nothing and encouraged me and did some things for me. And, and they got me out of the situation that I was in because sometimes you lose the will to do better. You lose the will to live and the will to succeed. And you get overwhelmed by the burden of the game. Sometimes, even today, the park looks better than the home I live in now because I made friends in the park. See, when I didn't have a coat, it was a homeless man who brought his nasty coat and his nasty blanket but he had two blankets and said it's gonna be cold tonight and gave me his nasty blanket and and then I realized while I was sitting next to him that this man who was cussing and stank and smoked and said he said you want some of this this'll help warm me up right here bro and if it don't it'll help you forget how you got here here <laughs> he started saying this some dank I said I don't cuss now I'm a Christian no Dank. What the, oh, dank. I said, I thought he was saying. It's going, what is, what are you talking about? And at that moment, though, I saw more of Christ in him than I have seen in most of us. At that moment, I heard the words of Christ say, if you have two coats, give it. Give one to some. If they ask you to go a mile, walk with them too. If, if. Someone asks for your bread, would you give them stones? If someone asks for your fish, would you give them scorpions? All of a sudden, the kingdom became so real to me. In one moment of my life, at that second, Kelly, I said, Kelly, I, I, truthfully, I've had too many friends and lost too many. I, I can't, I, I've built too many churches that have become whitewashed tombs and not actively involved kingdom. See, the church, I told Kelly, I need to hear your heart. Because he says, man, you're living in, in the bay, you're traveling a lot. Help me build this house. What can we do together? Can you help me? Maybe take a, we do something special. I, I said, no, I can't help you. Unless I know your heart. I've had too many people I thought were real. Played a good part. So he, said, he started talking to me. And I started hearing this. Boom, boom. And he started with all his vision, the building and all the other things. I kept listening. Boom, boom. And then as he was about to finish at the end, he said, he said, look, Veron, the truth is, I really, really love what I do. The reason I love what I do is because I know that I am nothing without 
without what God has made me. And he says, I know I can help people. I know because I have been helped by God. My life is better because of him. He flipped the script on me so quick because I was ready to tell him I'm a little busy for the next two years. (laughs) When he told me about the building, but then he told me about the people. And he started to tell me little stories of some of the things that they've done that necessarily haven't worked. He talked to me a little bit about the evangelism and about bringing people in and that he didn't see the results that he wanted to see. And he said, you know, I'm missing something. What is it? Why is nothing working? I said, because you haven't convinced these people ain't getting it. But I'll help them get it. See, what is a church? Here's what a church is. A church is a people whose heartbeat begins to pattern the heartbeat of God. It's not a building. You got it? A church is a people whose heartbeat patterns the heartbeat of God. A church is a people who begin to want the things he wants and love the things he loves. When his things become important to you, when your important things become least important and his important things become most important. See, you don't have to pray for money when his things become important to you. You don't have to pray for a raise on your job when you have given everything to feed the hungry and God's going to say, you feeding hungry folks, you think I'm going to let you go hungry and you you picking up people ain't got no car in your raggedy car. You think I'm going to keep letting you drive a raggedy car and you picking up folks ain't got no car you living in a two bedroom apartment you your husband and your two kids and now you letting a homeless person sleep on your couch you think I'm going to keep giving houses to other folks and not bless Berkeley, East Bay Area, Emeryville, Oakland, Richmond. This is a hodgepodge of cultural diversity. It is a spiritual epicenter of the northern west coast. From this region has come far more influencing streams of thought and ideology than have ever come from any other area in America. Not New York, which is the central capital of cosmopolitan thinking and intellectual ideology. It is from this area for some strange reason God has brought together an amalgamation of people who have changed the way they thought and in pursuit when other people went north from the south. Some went west from the south. Some went north to pursue Jobs, those that went west pursued education. That's true of the slave, mo- when, when slaves and uh, were, were, uh, slavery was abolished, the people that they said went west pursued education because the colleges here did not have a racial issues. And so black men and black women could become educated here. They pursued the intellectual superiority and desire to understand society and culture beyond it. It is from here that the Black Panther movement started. And for all of its negatives, there were some positives found there it is still in the bay area people talk about chicago jazz chicago jazz it was here sunday afternoons that there was an afro caribbean afro latin flair where people who played on the east coast long to catch a train to the west coast where john coltrane in basements in san francisco began to lick licks on pianos that people had never heard not no kenny g jazz that ain't jazz. Miles, jazz, dizzy, jazz. Herbie, you don't hear what I'm talking about. Not no pretty voice singing some pretty song. We're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about Ella, jazz. Nina Simone, whose voice was raggedy, but 
but she could bang out some notes and say, Cinnamon, where are you going? Run to jazz that when it could no longer find the adequate words, began to almost speaking in tongues, a sounding sound that was born from pain and struggle, a sound that could not come just from intellectual superiority, but was born from the heart, a sound that needed an outlet. That's what the church is supposed to be, a group of people who are desperate, looking to expand themselves like the Bay Area, find a place that welcomes anybody. It was here when black people and white people couldn't go to the same club on the East Coast. It was in the Bay Area that black people sat together with white people and said, now that's what I'm talking about. They understood that what the world uses to separate us, we use to join us. We can find a common love if we cannot find a common culture. Huh? Yeah. Empty seats. If you're sitting next to an empty seat, you should be broken. If you're sitting next to an empty seat, you should be repenting so deeply and said, I have failed you this week. God, deliver this church from empty seats. When you get in your car and drive home, Gas is too expensive to have three empty seats. There are people sitting on bus benches trying to get home today that you would drive by because you put a roast. See, the problem with inviting people to drive in my car is I have to hear their story. I don't want to hear their story, but you have to hear their story. See, the problem with knocking on doors is I get to leave and go to the next door. That's why it's a failed form of evangelism. Street evangelism, failed, doesn't work. Why? Because people are not interested in you shaking their hand, praying a little prayer, and then never talking to them after. And the only reason you're calling them is to bring them to church, but you're not, you don't want to come to their house on Wednesday. Ain't no church on Wednesday. Don't go to their house on Thursday. Ain't no church on Thursday. See, people know when you have ulterior motives. They know when you're just trying to bring people to church to fill it up because it's empty, but not because you're trying to bring people to church because their life is as important as your life. I'm finished. I'm through. Listen. Jesus says these words. Did I offend you? Be offended. He said, that's what he said. Huh? I don't care if I offend you. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a man. Watch, and I'm finished now. What time is it? All right. All right, I'm finished. The kingdom of God is like. A man who has lost a silver coin, a gold coin of great value. Watch what he says. And he goes and buys the whole field to get the one coin. The whole field. See, I'm glad he bought my whole field. See, there are some things about people I don't like. I don't like dumb people. I don't. I don't have I've very little tolerance for ignorance. I don't, I don't like it. I hate people that have opinions that haven't been well thought out. I don't hate people that just talk for the sake of talking. You're like, can you shut up? Do you, can I buy a break? How much will it cost me? There's nothing more irritating. But that's me. And sometimes God will bring those people into your life. And I'm like, why? you like a spiritual vampire. I can't. Interview with a vampire. This, Halloween, I've been living Halloween. Some of my friends have been, all year, been some Halloween trick-or-treats. I ain't scared of apples with razor blades. I'm scared of church folk with psychological disorders. And God says, but is there anything valuable in them? Yes, their soul. So listen to what God says. You can't only have their soul. What do you mean? If their soul is important, the only way you get their soul, you have to buy their whole field. Varan, you have to put up with all the things that irk your personality, your 
Ivy League education, your ability to enunciate the Greek and Hebrew properly and understand the differentiation between corne and classical and rabbinical and ancient and modern Hebrew. And they can barely, they in the band, what it do? Yada da mean? What the? Yada da. Handolo boshandai. I feel the God moving. Yada da. Shake your dreadlocks. What you? I ain't got no dreadlocks. What you talking about? Watch. You have to put up with all the things that you may not understand. Well, how can I do that? I mean, they, if I see them down the street, they work my nerves. God said it's real easy. A dead person has no nerves. A dead person has no idea of being offended. A dead person. I told you, you can't follow me unless you pick up your cross. You, this life, you can't live unless you live it like I died it. You can't live unless you live dead. See, Veron, the reason you got to put up with their crap is because every day I put up with yours. So next time you have a little problem loving somebody because they ain't acting right. How many times did you not act right, but I kept loving you but they hurt me how many times did you hurt me but 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 okay god i i i will forgive them and let them back in my life but i need to know why when was the last time you came to me and asked for forgiveness and i asked you why at this altar i have never stood with question marks i have only stood with open arms live like i died and your life will find meaning again standing on your feet all over this place if you are here this morning there are three altar calls i'm gonna make in a minute We're going to respond quickly, so nobody leaving, nobody leaving. This is a very austere and auspicious moment. The Holy Spirit is speaking. How many of you feel the weight of God's word to us this morning? I feel feel the weight of God's word. Jesus said, do I offend you because I didn't wash my hands? You wash your hands and you're still dirty. Ask anybody in the world, ask them why they don't come to church. They'll tell you. You know why people don't come to church? You know what they'll say? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. But you're saying, but I ain't sleeping with nobody. I'm, I've been faithful to my wife. I ain't never messed up. See, you all think because you keep your pants down and your dress, or your dress down and your pants up, you okay. There's far more to spirituality than sleeping around and cussing. They know. Christianity has never been defined by religious ritual and ceremony. It's not defined where you wear pants or dress, you got makeup on or no makeup. It's never defined by how deep you speak in tongues and how your hair is did and none of those things. Some of you sit in chairs every week getting your hair done. And the person that does your hair has never come to church. You're getting pretty to go to church and your life has never touched them enough to come to church. You should take that money. And next time, don't get your hair done and say, I'm putting this in your hand. Just because I've been sitting here for 10 years and my life hasn't impacted you and I need to repent. That whatever I have said or not said in this chair has not touched your life enough to have you say, why are you getting all pretty? What you doing? You getting ready for Sunday? How many? Barbershops testify against us as we sit there getting our hair lined up. And yet our life has never touched the young men sitting in line waiting for the next spot. And they talking all kinds of mess. We getting ready for Sunday morning. They getting ready for Saturday night. And we walk out from a room filled with darkness. And our light has not impacted one. Sunday morning, 
has become a ritual. Every Sunday we get up, we get dressed, we get dressed, we get dressed. We do the same thing week after week, but we do not change our lives. God, save us from ourselves. If you are here and you are not a Christian, if you are not saved, if you've been coming to church for years, because people go to church. Maybe you were invited today. Maybe you came to the early service so you can have the rest of your day off. You were almost excited till you saw me here. Said, I thought we was going to get out early. <laughs> but something I said today, for something for some strange reason tapped your intellect. Now, the funny thing is, is that God is not only speaking to you. He's speaking to the people who are sitting next to you. Because if you've never been saved, or maybe you have been saved, you're backslid. Maybe you've walked away from the things of God because you've become discouraged by the things you have seen. Maybe... You have failed. Maybe you're dealing right now with failed situations in your home, failed situations in your finances. This is an economy that is destroying people. Jobs are being taken and there are no jobs. You're looking for jobs and can't find one. And what do you do in a time like this? Then this is a time that you say, God, I, I can't look at people. I'm looking at you. I, I can't do this by myself. I can't do this by myself and I need you. That's all salvation is. Salvation is a group of people that say, I, I'm, I'm not good at life. I'm not really good at this. I've only been doing it for 60 years and I'm an eternal being. I'm still a baby in terms of time. What do I do? How do I do? See, when you leave church feeling worse than you did when you came in, then you have failed at the, at the purpose of church. You're not supposed to leave here saying, I could never do what they are called to do. Let me tell you something, that the best of us, the best of us, the best of us, oh, we fix it up every Sunday. We wear it better than you. But the truth is, the truth that Jesus makes painfully clear is that it is not our dressing up and our verbosity and vernacular. It's not the way we say things. We have a church cliche that's not relevant to the world there are languages there's a language that we use in terms that we use that they never understand so they feel disassociated the truth is we we clean up real well but old folks used to have a saying you can dress them up but you can't take them out that's the truth about us we dress up well but we are no different we deal with the same things and the same failures and Oftentimes, the reason we have pushed you away is not because we didn't love you. It is because we didn't want you to see that we really is not as perfect as you think we are. Sometimes it's not even us who tell you that we're perfect. It's because you have had a false perception of the church because past generations preached that the church has to be clean and perfect and holy. And the Bible says that he's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. And that is nowhere in the Bible. Huh? Huh? No, not one verse. Show it to me. I'll eat it. I'll eat everybody's Bible if everybody's Bible has one verse that says he is coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. He never said he was coming for a church. He said, I will present the church to myself without spot or wrinkle. You can't straighten your life out. Only he can. He's not coming for a perfect church. He's coming for an imperfect church that desperately needs him. To perfect them if you could be perfect without him he wouldn't have to come he's coming again to clean us up if you are here and you have wrinkles and you have issues if you have sin if you have made some mistakes if you have missed church for the last six months if you have stopped going to church three four years ago if there's anything in your life that says I have failed but I need him I need him now not because I don't even know what it's all about I just need him and then I'm going to ask you, if you're here and what I said talks to you, I don't want you to come down right now. What I need you to do is to grab the hand. Not everybody. If you're here and you're not saved or you're a backslider, you've been dis disconnected from God and something in you says, Bishop, what you preach today is what I have always believed the church should be, but I have not seen a church like that. But today I think I've heard something that I need to be a part of. And I think that this house, Kelly told me when he shared his heart, I said, let's do this, man. Whatever I can do as your friend, as your covenant. See, 
this building can't hold it. Last, let me tell you something. I came two weeks ago to, to attend church here. I couldn't find a parking space. I didn't know y'all had the one over the bank. but So I had to park, I drove around 15 times and had to park down the street. And I told Kelly, I said, what can we do to get y'all some decent parking and, and a building to hold the people? Because it was raining. And it was pouring rain. And I'm, I'm like, I ain't got but two good suits. And I'm trying to. What can we do? It takes money. But we don't want it. We don't want your money. Not if your heart's not attached to it. This house has great things to do, and if you would join any church or be any place that you could be touched by the lives of imperfect people, I one thing I know about this house, this is not a house just trying to play the game. This is a house that's saying, God, there's got to be more. That's why some of you joined the church. You forgot why you joined the church. Some of you were in other people's churches, and you came to this church. Well, why stop going to one church to go to another church if there's not something different at that church from the church you were at? This church touched you because it said there was more. This preacher touched you because he pa preached passionately from a desire for healthy, mature, spiritual living. And yet you became complacent in the place that you came to be fed. Don't stop. If you are here today, grab the hand. If this message has touched you and you are not saved, but you want God desperately to meet you where you are. You don't even know. If you, now I'm not asking you to change your life today. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to give up drinking, smoking, gambling, whatever it is, messing around, whatever you, I'm not asking you to do any of that. All I'm asking you to do is say, God, I'm a mess and I need you. See, if he can't touch your life with the grace and strength to change it, then he ain't worth following. All I'm asking you to do is give him a chance. Give him a chance. I don't care if this Saturday you in bed with somebody you ain't married to. Get up in the morning and say, I got to go someplace. You can come and you can stay. I'll talk to you later. I'm telling you, bring your cigarettes, bring them. And if you got to take a smoking break in the middle of service, you go outside. We don't smoke in the building. That's just the way we do it. You go outside, have your cigarette, come back in. That's what I'm telling you. Leave your gun in the car. If you got to pick it up when you go back, don't bring no guns in because some of us ain't fully saving. If we... I'm not asking you to change your life. I'm asking you to acknowledge that there's a power that's greater than you. And his name is Jesus. He is the author and the finisher. He is the divine example. He sat at our table one day and judged us and said, you have made them uncomfortable. Shame on us. Today, he's saying and he's apologizing to you on our behalf and saying, I'm sorry, my folks is a little messed up. They're a little crazy. And he's calling you to give the church, him and us a second chance. If that's you today, grab the hand of the person you're sitting next to because salvation does not come through just praying at altars. It comes through the lives of the people you are sitting next to. If you are here and you are not saved, I need you to grab the hand of the person you are sitting next to. And I need you to, I need that person to take your hand and lift it up right where you are. Lift it up, lift it up. One, two, thank you. Three, four, right there. Five, there. six, thank you. If you're here today, that's Handorobosha. Now.